uh, resources, 66,000 flat, remember that, it's flat, uh, unlimited access to the sea, right here we're 15 minutes away, and nowhere in the world are you far from the ocean. Uh, it had, at the time, the largest national forest in Florida. The Apalachicola National Forest had just become uh, uh, Eglin. Uh, it had a working railroad system, year-round good weather, a litter of population, which was to a large extent unemployed. It had a couple of uh, uh, industries such as uh, truck farming, hospitality, and budding aviation industry, uh, all of which militate towards uh, uh, Let's move on. Okay, I, I discussed with, you, with it. He made a lot of business. Yep, he did. Okay. One of the things he created was the Hepburn Commission. Hepburn was uh, uh, a four star. He was getting ready to retire. And this incident with Pan A and other incidents around the world, the rise of Mussolini, uh, the Hitler regime, and uh, Hepburn put in his papers and uh, the president said, not so fast. And so Hepburn was commissioned to go around the world and give recommendations for uh, how to increase our, our naval preparedness. Uh, next slide. Okay, he did this. One of the things they recommended was a system of naval districts. Uh, we're in the, uh, what is it, the uh, 7th Coast Guard District these days? Uh, back in the day, it was the 7th Naval District. The, the co we gave it to the Coasties because, you know, puddle jumpers and, and blue waters and uh, clubs. Okay. So, yeah, that, yes, the Coast Guard is the small nucleus around which the Navy assembles in time of war and emergency. Uh, Okay, so Hepburn's people uh, came up with that. Next slide. They were interested in Jacksonville, and, and uh, I mentioned Jacksonville had a campground for the National Guard at Camp Foster down here. Uh, but Hepburn saw, and his people saw a whole lot more. They said, well, they, they offered the Army, they cut a deal with the Army, uh, in which case the, the, uh, the Army surrendered Camp Foster to the Navy. In exchange, the Army got uh, Camp Landing, which a huge installation, which we'll, we'll talk about tangentially. So why would the Navy want uh, NAS Jacksonville? There's two reasons. At the time, this is before World War II, Seaplanes, flying boats were a big part of aviation. Why? Because there weren't a lot of airports. And St. John's River is fresh water. And anybody who's gone to NAS Jackson jumped in the river knows it's fresh water. Salt water is death on, on seaplanes, the corrosive factors. So uh, NAS Jax was nice because you could, it was fresh water, you could have seaplanes. And in fact they did, by golly. Uh, Hepburn sent uh, uh, three uh, seaplanes there to test it out. Can you land there? Can you take off there? What's it all about? And they reported, yes, it could. The other reason is it's too far away from the coast for enemy naval gunfire. We don't like to think about that, but back in the day, the possibility that the enemy might sail up close and, and uh, shell you was a reality. So, NAS Jax was safe for that, those two reasons and valuable to the Navy. Uh, Mayport, the other half, up here where the river, at the mouth of the river, is one minute away from the ocean. You can get underway. Uh, from Mayport, you're going to be at sea in a minute. You, you know as well, it's right there. So, and because this is a flat line here, once you reach the ocean, you can go on any course. You can go on a course of 2 degrees, 5 degrees, 90 degrees, 120, 179. 
and you can change it. Those are valuable reasons for uh, uh, nautical interest. Uh, and of course, last but not least, uh, because of the configuration of the mouth of the river there, you could easily put a submarine net. Remember now, there were three midget submarines that attacked at Pearl Harbor. The idea, this is, uh, this is right around the time of, of uh, Gunther Prime, who took his little U-boat into a place called Scapa Flow and sank an aircraft carrier, a British one, an aircraft carrier, with a torpedo. So the idea of being able to protect yourselves from submarines was real. And of course, you could put a chain across the thing to protect from uh, surface combatants. So for those reasons, this was uh, militarily uh, of interest to the Navy. And of course, last, down here, you have Banana River, which became Patrick Air Force Base. Uh, Banana River was a seaplane base because right down here is where the Florida Straits emerges into the, uh, the Gulf Stream. Next slide. Those are some of the, the considerations of Hepburn and his commission who went all over. Uh, and in fact, they were the ones who recommended that the Pacific Fleet be moved from San Diego to Hawaii. <laughs> to bring it more in line with forward positioning. They didn't recommend uh, for, for its skippers to be <coughs> golfing on, you know, on Sundays, but they did recommend moving the fleet. They recommended a, a whole lot of other uh, <coughs> things which the United States embarked on. Okay, and it's well that they did because in 1940, uh, Hitler and Stalin were allies. It's, uh, it, you know, you wonder who was the worst mass murderer, Hitler, Stalin, uh, hard to tell, but those two people were allies. And when uh, the war broke out in 1939, it wasn't just that Hitler invaded uh, Poland from the uh, going east, Stalin invaded from going west, and between them they split Poland. After that, you know what happened with France, is France had built the Maginot Line, a, a great concrete wall to protect itself. Um, Hitler, of course, what's a dictator to do if you're going to conquer the world? You have to you go around the wall. Well, that's a neutral country. Well, so what? Uh, so France fell in six weeks. What that did was in this region here, French West Africa, and there was collaboration uh, by some of the French uh, with the, the Nazi regime, and England was on the ropes. If you were a foreign power going to try to conquer the last remaining democracy uh, in North America, the way to do it is you go, you bring your forces down to French West Africa and you stage across this place, which uh, the sailors will know, it's the Dakar Narrows, the, 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 the Narrows of the Atlantic. And then you work your way up, uh, up to the, the archipelago here. Is anyone going to stop you? Mexico, perhaps? Uh, Argentina? <laughs> Not, not very likely. And where do you, where do you end up? The sunny beaches of Florida. That was on the minds. Next slide. Of military planners. So they got busy. And the Navy created 25 bases here in World War II. Count them. They're all over the place. And most of them were along the coast here, which in, in given the scenario they were looking at, what's the front as far as the Navy's concerned? The ocean. So the Navy base is all up and down the coast here to defend against just such a possibility. Next slide. The Army equally 
got interested in Florida because they had their own experts, such as uh, a, a, a similar body to the Hepburn Commission. And the Army studied uh, their situation. And next slide. Uh, okay, Billy Mitchell, uh, next slide. His acolyte, uh, uh, Hap Arnold, uh, was in command of the Army Air Corps at that time. It was by happenstance, an air accident, and a uh, uh, ground pounder who was in charge of the, yeah. Uh, Chuck, uh, can you give me a 20 minute heads up on the time when there's 20 minutes left? There's 10 minutes left? I thought it was 50. <laughs> but anyway, all right, let me know when there's five. Uh, the Army, have proposed a, a major base for uh, uh, each quadrant of, of the continent. And we discussed him. The Air Force or the Air, Army Air Corps went in with two components: bombers and fighters. Uh, there was also something uh, the civilians had a cargo plane. The Army didn't have any cargo planes. They had no air uh, airlift capability. But to cause a, a civilian cargo plane to become an Army plane, what do you need? Green paint, which is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, next slide. Okay, the Army could have chosen any place for their Southeast Quadrant base. They chose McDill. They chose it over Tennessee, over uh, Georgia, all those places. And the Army got even busier than the Navy because the Army is always larger. Uh, they created 44 uh, Army airfields. Uh, for fighters, but mostly for bomber training, because you just fly out over the, the Gulf and drop your bombs. Um, it was simpler. And also, for your inland, remember now, it, it doesn't take that much to turn Ocala National Force into a bombing range. It takes a stroke of the pen. And so, uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, we, we know about the situation here. Fortunately, Hitler and, and Stalin fell out. And Hitler went east rather than west. Next slide. But we still, we, we only got a slight reprieve until December 7th. Okay. Yeah, we looked about how the enemy would come to invade, uh, to conquer North America. Because they didn't, uh, roads go either way. It doesn't matter. So out of Florida, was created the, the South Atlantic route to get to the war. The North Atlantic route went along this way, the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, and it was quite dangerous most of the year. The Southern route was safe, but it was about 10 times as long. You go across Africa, next slide. Ah, among other things, the aviation was so important in Florida that the commander in chief actually, uh, he lied to the press, said he was going to Hyde Park to, to Woodshed. Uh, they, he said, come with me to the, air, to, the, to the train station. They did, he got on a train going north, the, the press all the way. The train went north until nightfall, and then it stopped. A train doesn't need to turn around, it goes both ways. And the train uh, stopped going north and started going south, two days and it came up in uh, Florida. They, they came to a railhead. The, uh, the had, what a coincidence, the Secret Service was there with all the cars, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They got them to uh, a dinner key. They boarded Mr. Jones and his private party, uh, ordered, ordered a couple clippers, and they flew across that route to North Africa inspected the troops who were invading at that time, and then came back. Ah, uh, okay. <coughs> time constraints don't allow us to look at everything, but we will look uh, for a few minutes at one of the three theaters of active combat operations in the Western Hemisphere. There was significant ground and air and naval uh, operations in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. By the same token that Darwin, Australia was bombed, so was Dutch Harbor in Alaska. And there was significant combat uh, in the Aleutian Islands, in Attu, Kiska, 
uh, and the like. The second and in some ways largest theater of active combat was along the eastern seaboard of the United States. It was uh, the Battle of the Atlantic. The third theater was right here. There was active uh, combat going on because, like Mahan said, this region's got some stuff going for it. Uh, the, the Nazis were many things, but they were not stupid. They could read a chart. Uh, and yeah, and a chart shows you where the shallows are, so you can't just go where it's three feet of water. You have to go where you can get through. And so, the next slide. That's the same chart, and that shows uh, the reality of the situation. It, it was uh, uh, the, the Nazi U-boat service came here in droves. They fought like hell. They, we, they sank 98 ships. They should, the first one was sunk right off uh, uh, the Jacksonville uh, beach, the, the, the Massachusetts. These were mostly, uh, these were civilian ships, but a uh, bottom's a bottom. You, you sink it, and it's all to the good, uh, as if you're the enemy. Now remember, your oil is coming from Texas to get to the manufacturing centers. So there again, if you sink a tanker, it will be even better. Uh, whether it's full or empty, it makes no difference. You've also got your bauxite convoys to make aluminum. So you've got a lot going on, and these are all ships that were sunk. Uh, it was an all-hands effort to put them down <coughs> here at the, at the mouth of the Mississippi. It was mine. They came that close. Next slide. Uh, that's just one ship that was this. one was a uh, torpedo that sailed past Miami, and everyone watched it, and uh, it flew over to photographs. Uh, we got PT boats uh, into the action. That's the coastline of the uh, uh, port of Miami. Moving right along. The Cuban Navy even got involved. And that, uh, for us here, we got okay. Right, moving right along. The, Cuba, the idea was to uh, cause the enemy uh, to stop sinking our ships. You cause them to do that by either killing them uh, which in war is customary, uh, or forcing them to leave. Um, we empowered the, the, our ally, the Cuban Navy, with uh, uh, sub-chasers, uh, and they sank a, uh, a U-boat. And here you go, that's the, uh, that's a, you know him, you recognize him, he's a squid. Uh, you got uh, some zeros. And then you've got the Cuban Navy. Here they are being honored because that's what allies do. Uh, moving right along. Okay, another aspect of the combat. See, the Navy wasn't planning to fight U-boats. They were thinking the, bit, the, the, the battleship were going to get out there and have a slugfest. Uh, the enemy didn't cooperate. They created U-boats which is long hours, dull, boring. Your enemy is this little thing, and you can't even see them. So the Navy, uh, it took some reorientation uh, to start building ships out of wood, once again, as a sub chased wood, but wood doesn't attract magnetism, so it's harder to detect, and it's cheaper and quicker. And what were needed were lots of smaller uh, vessels. Uh, patrolling, boring, endless hours. The Splinter Fleet, it was mentioned yesterday that even yachts uh, of the wealthy were commandeered or volunteered. Okay, and they used blimps. There you go. Okay, these funny things, oh yeah, go back. These are funny things, constantly. you see them above the football games. However, in World War II, the Navy had 135 of them on combat patrols all along the West Coast and the East Coast. Why? Because down in here were 10 sailors armed with a machine gun, four bombs, 
radar, and as time went by, even sonar. Sonar, you know, sonar is under the water. How would they do that? They lowered a cable into the water. Okay, the idea is to find out where the enemy is. So if this guy, and, the, and unlike a fixed wing aircraft, which is speeding over at 100 plus miles an hour, these guys could stay on station indefinitely. And so it forced the enemy to stay underwater. If you can't kill the enemy, break his leg. The, uh, uh, the virtue of forcing the enemy underwater, one, you slowed him down by, by more than half because your, uh, your cell phone, when it's plugged into the wall outlet, you're golden. Okay, but when you got it in your hand, it's only got a little, so much juice. When the, when the U-boat was forced underwater, it could not operate with the diesels. So it had to switch to battery power. The batteries were not strong enough. Their, their speed was reduced by half. Second thing is if you keep them underwater long enough, they're going to run out of something else, oxygen. They're either going to asphyxiate or they're going to be forced to leave. So those are the virtues, next slide, of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the military asset of, of airships. They've come into to vote again a little bit. There's a dozen of them in Afghanistan uh, deployed. The reason is, is now they're, they're platforms for your, your beams, your, your cell phones and things. They, can, they have that look down over the horizon capability where they can say, hey, Fred, there's uh, some, some bandits uh, coming at you. They're still 20 miles down the road, but heads up. That sort of thing. Here is simply, this is a, a patrol sector. We all know about that. Uh, NAS Richmond was the headquarters. We had bases in Brownville. We had uh, a major base in Humble, Louisiana. We had uh, ancillary fields, four of them in Cuba. These stations went all the way down to Brazil, uh, and they were important for the reasons we discussed. Uh, next slide. Yeah, yeah. Who knew? The United States trained for its amphibious landings in Florida. All three of the divisions that landed in D-Day practiced here first. Uh, we're, we're running on fumes now, so uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. There's a couple I want to get to if I can. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, the, the, the year around good weather. Uh, all, all of Florida was, was facing. We talked about Jacksonville, uh, Tampa. The, the next slide. Uh, next. Okay, I don't know where it is, but we will we will uh, conclude with a couple of uh, of naval operations during the, the combat. Uh, in this theater that we talked about. One is, we, we mentioned that, yeah, you can just flip through them, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the Cuban Navy sank the U-boat. There was uh, uh, one of them sunk off the, uh, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, off uh, of uh, the Mississippi River. Um, there was even an active combat between <coughs> Yeah, and black GIs from, from Florida, they're the ones who, who built the Burma Road. Yeah, who knew? Uh, a blimp went off, off of, uh, from NAS Richmond in Miami, keep going, and it was a night patrol. They had been briefed that there were two freighters in the channel, the, the Florida Straits. They went down for each one when they caught them on radar, identified them, kept going. Yeah, just keep going. There's something that I want to find. If I, yeah. Then they got a third radar blip. They went in to investigate, and it turned out it was the U-134 uh, Nazi sub on the surface, and it was coming into position to sink the. Yeah, stop there. Uh, to sink those two freighters. So the skipper of the blimp went to general quarters. And you had the, the highly unusual situation of uh, one time only of a blimp in combat against a submarine. 